Well, let's turn in our Bibles tonight to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 as we continue to work our way through this wonderful book. I think Kevin mentioned uh, a week or two ago that these chapters are filled with so many memorable and familiar uh, passages, and we come to another one of those tonight in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 to 10, as Paul speaks to us about our heavenly dwelling. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 10. As we read this together, remember this is God's holy word. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. And so we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And let's join together in prayer as we ask for God to bless us as we study tonight. Father, we thank you for your word, and we just sang together that in following your word, we find safety and we find life. And so we pray, Father, that you would impart to us again tonight as we open your word, um, words of life to our hearts, words of life to our souls. We pray, Father, that we would capture tonight Paul's words here of a vision of a heavenly dwelling that is coming for us that we would be filled with hope, that we would be people of good courage, that we would be people who seek to please the Lord in all that we do. And we pray these things in Christ's name, amen. Well, dear friends in the Lord Jesus Christ, a number of years ago, Sherry and I owned a cottage in Michigan, and we had a neighbor who lived across the street from us who had bought an older cottage and wanted to build replaced that older college, wanted to build a permanent home. And so on the very same piece of property that this old cottage sat, they wanted to build a home that they could live in permanently. They were going to move from town out to the lake. And while they were doing this, while they were going through the construction project, this family lived in a trailer. It was more than a tent, but something that was still temporary. And so as you know how it goes when you're staying in a trailer, you, when it's time for bed at night, you turn tables into beds. And then the next morning, you turn the beds back into tables. A, they had a tiny bathroom, a shower that had water tanks, and every so often they'd have to empty the water tanks. They were missing the normal creature comforts that come with a home. And, and the longer they spent living in the trailer, waiting for their home to be finished, the greater their longing for something permanent came about. The trailer was good for a time, but of course they longed for something that was stable, something that they could settle down in and remain in for years and years to come. All of us, I imagine, have seen around our city in various places, especially as we make our way towards uptown, these tent cities, neighborhoods that have sprung up, tents plopped here and there, and, and, and these, in a sense, really have become sort of permanent homes for people. Yet we all understand, even our government officials understand that this should not be, this isn't the kind of thing that you're supposed to live in forever, forever. 
And so there's discussion, of course, about finding affordable, permanent housing. How do we move people out of a tent city into permanent dwellings? Or you might think about the retired couple that you know or have become familiar with that has sold their home and they make their way around the country in an RV, right? Sold everything they had, that which was sort of stable and permanent, and they hop in their RV and they are now living in something that is movable and temporary, but the same reality exists. They eventually go back to something more permanent at some time. Well, in 2 Corinthians here, Paul has been telling us about his sufferings and their purposes. Chapter 4, verse 7, Kevin preached on it a few weeks ago. We have this treasure in jars of clay. The gospel ministry, Paul says, carried about by weak, fragile people to show that our strength is not in ourselves, but it comes from God. Or as you studied last week, chapter 4, verse 16, our outer self is wasting away even while we're inwardly being renewed. Our bodies failing us even while God is at work inside to renew our hearts and our souls and to fix them upon him. And the afflictions that we face, they are preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. Affliction now in our lives and the glory is to come. Well, in our passage here tonight, Paul gets more specific about the glory. And he says the glory is this, that the tents that we live in, these bodies, they are going to give way when Christ comes back, going to give way to resurrected bodies. There is a heavenly dwelling that we have to look forward to when Jesus returns. There are three things that I want to point out about this passage that Paul brings to our attention. The first is this, that Paul says we groan for this. He talks about groaning in two different ways, actually, in this passage. The first way he talks about it is this, that we groan while we live in these bodies, we groan over what is temporary and failing. And this is what Paul has been saying, isn't it, as he's been talking about suffering. Paul has been incredibly realistic about life, that life in this world involves hardship, and trouble, and sickness, and affliction. That is true for us spiritually. We face persecution as Christians. It is true for us relationally. We all know and experience certain conflicts that come in our relationships with others. But what Paul is really emphasizing here in this passage, and even in the verses before this one, is that this is also true for us physically. That our life here on this earth physically involves hardship and suffering. So this is what he has been meaning when he said, our outer self is wasting away. The bodies that we live in fail us over time. We don't get better with age. We get weaker with age. We feel it. We know it. And Paul says we groan because of it. Look how he puts it in verse 4. He says, while we are still in this tent, we groan being burdened. There's a burden that comes with life in this world or in this body. And Paul's been emphasizing this all throughout this text with the kind of language that he uses. He's trying to bring a mental picture to our mind that life in this world involves suffering. And so he calls our bodies tents. They are temporary, flimsy, unstable, Paul, of course, knew all about tents. He was a tent maker. But what a great image for our bodies, that our bodies, as it were, are pitched up, set up at birth, and they easily come down at our death. He also uses the language here of mortality. So it says in verse 4, what is mortal may be swallowed up in life. Our life here in this world is a mortal life. We are subject to death and dying. And then he goes on to say, to be at home in this body is to be away 
from the Lord. That while we're in this body, we are away from where we want to be, and that is to be with Christ. And friends, all of this brings a certain amount of groaning, doesn't it? That we feel the burden over physical failure and decay. I said to a few people recently that the 50s have uh, not been good for me. Um, haven't been good for me physically. Um, my hearing is not what it ought to be. Gotten glasses in the 50s. Now I have a genetic heart condition. Take medicines. So much to be thankful for, but this body just ain't what it used to be. And that involves a certain groaning. There's a, a T-shirt that I have, a Nike T-shirt that um, has the Nike swoop on the front of it, and then it says run. Well, you know that since my accident a few weeks ago, or a few months ago rather, I can't run anymore. I've said to Sherry, it, my, my T-shirt really ought to say walk or shuffle uh, because, because that's, what, that's what my life is like now. And when you experience this, you experience, right, a certain amount of groaning over that. And it's not just as, even as we age. We have some friends, I was reading a Facebook post that they put out just this last week. They just adopted a daughter from India. And they took this little girl to the doctor because they understood that there were a number of physical maladies and ailments that she may be facing. It isn't just when you're old. Yes, it happens more when you, as you get old. But it, the, the, the failure of our bodies, the frailty of our bodies, even sometimes affects us when we're young. At some point, there is a groaning for something other because of what is temporary and failing. But Paul says we also groan over what is eternal and lasting. And this groaning is not a sigh over what is, but it is a longing for what is to come. This is true for us as Christians. Paul says in verses 1 and 2, we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God. That's great news, isn't it? A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If the language of life in this body is tent, mortality, to be away from the Lord, the language of the resurrection of the body that Paul is speaking of here is building, dwelling place, a house not made with hands but from God, not mortality but life, to be at home with the Lord, not to be found naked but rather to be clothed. It's the language, you see, of permanence, of what is eternal and lasting and glorious. Paul might have had in mind in using this kind of language, thinking back to the Old Testament and the tabernacle and the temple. The tabernacle gave way to the temple, and so these bodies will give way to a resurrected body, to, to a dwelling, to a building. The temple sur superseded the tabernacle, and so our resurrected bodies are going to supersede these bodies. Maybe you recall how Paul described all of this in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, what is sown, these bodies sown, what is sown is perishable, but what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in natural body and it is raised a spiritual body, just a tremendous contrast that Paul makes between the bodies that we live in now and the bodies that we will be given. Friends, this is what we long for, isn't it? Life in the resurrection of the body when Jesus returns. Theologians sometimes talk about something called an intermediate state, and that is our life with Christ after death before the resurrection. When we die, our souls immediately go to be with Christ while our bodies go to the ground. We have to wait for the resurrection. And Paul's describing that here. He says, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, this is verse 4, not that we would be 
unclothed, but that we would be further clothed. Our groaning, our burden, is to be further clothed, to, to receive the body that is to come. Not just to go to heaven, but to get our new bodies, not to be left without a tent. And so you see, even though we're with Christ when we die, there's still something that is left unfinished. Part of Christ's redemptive work that is still to come, and that is the resurrection, that last step of our salvation to be completed. Friends, is this something that you groan for? Groan longing to be clothed with the body that is to come. Understandably, this groaning is something that intensifies as you get older. When you're young, life is good. You're healthy, strong, seems like you can live forever. The more we feel the burden of this tent, though, the more God moves us to long for the building the body that is to come. One of the members of our previous church, she just turned 100 years old this past Friday, Blanche. And when I announced that I was leaving First Byron to come to Christ's covenant, Blanche said to me, she says, you know, I was supposed to leave before you. Of course, what she meant is I was supposed to go to be with the Lord before you left this church. An eagerness to be with Christ. Is that something that marks you? Well, second, Paul not only talks about groaning, but he talks about a guarantee, a guarantee that we are going to be raised and given a new body. And Paul talks about this guarantee in a couple of ways, both of them in verse 5. He says, first of all, that he who has prepared us for this very thing is God. What Paul is saying is that from the very first moments of our experience of God's grace, God has been fitting us for eternal life, even with a resurrected body. His work of grace is a work of renovation. His work of grace is a work of remodeling us, of renewing us, of restoring us, of exchanging the old for the new. And God has been and is at work preparing us for the resurrection. He's even doing that right now. Well, think about how God is at work in that. We can go back, for example, to our regeneration when we were born again by the Spirit of God. When God took away our heart of stone and gave us a heart of flesh, a dead heart, and gave us a new heart, and then gives us, giving us the gift to, of faith to believe and to trust in Christ. Jesus in John chapter 5 said, He who believes... Him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. He who believes in him who has sent me has eternal life, and he has passed from death to life. Passing from death to life, you see, isn't just something that we are waiting for when our life comes to an end. But Jesus says that experience has already happened, this passing from death to life. And coming to faith in Christ, we already have gone through a death to life experience, a kind of resurrection experience. God is at work preparing us for what is to come. We can think about our sanctification and what that process is like. Paul in the book of Colossians and in other places in the New Testament, says it is, it is like putting off clothes that we're wearing and putting on new clothes or putting to death things like sexual immorality and impurity and evil desires and covetousness and then putting on compassionate hearts and kindness and humility and meekness. And just as one day we're going to put off these old bodies and put on a new one, so already we are now to put off sinful ways and to put on the clothing of the Spirit. And remember, we do this through the same kind of power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Paul says the very power that was at work to raise Christ from the dead is power that has been given to us to live a godly life, to put off sin and death and to put on righteousness and obedience 
There is resurrection power for our sanctification. And so you see, as God is at work in us, as a Christian, God is already at work by his grace preparing us for the resurrection. We are already going through a death-to-life experience as believers. This is what our conversion was about. We went from death to life. This is what repentance looks like being dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. And you see what God is doing in our hearts and in our lives by his grace now, he is also going to do to our bodies when Jesus Christ comes back again. As you're able to see God at work in you now, this is the assurance that he will complete his work in you in the future. As Paul said in Philippians 1, he who began a good work in us will carry it on to completion, even to the complete renovation and resurrection of our bodies. What God is doing in our hearts now, God is going to do in our bodies in time to come. And how is he doing all of this? Well, Paul says it here. Of course, he is doing it by his spirit. He has given us the Spirit, Paul says, verse 5, as a guarantee of these things. You see, the guarantee of the resurrection isn't just a process that God is at work in us, doing in us right now. The guarantee of the resurrection is actually a person. It is the presence and person of God by His Spirit taking up residence in our hearts. The word that Paul uses here for guarantee in modern Greek is used to describe an engagement ring. So you think about when you've gotten engaged. If, you've, if you're married and you think back to that time when you became engaged and a ring was given to you, well, that ring meant this, that there's more to come, right? I want to marry you. We're getting engaged. And that means there's more to come. There's more beyond this day. I'm pledging myself to marry you. It's almost like a down payment, isn't it? Down payment being a pledge that the rest of the payments are going to come. You put down the down payment on your car or on your house, and what you're saying to the bank is, I'm going to keep making payments until all the payments have been given. And the Spirit of God is like that. The Spirit of God has been given to us as a down payment as a pledge that the full payments are going to come, even the resurrection of our bodies. Paul is saying to us tonight, is the Spirit at work in your life? Do you know that the Spirit lives within you, that you, even your body, is a temple of the Holy Spirit? You see the Spirit at work in you now, that is a guarantee that he is going to completely transform you one day. That when Jesus Christ comes, that old body will give way, the new body will be given. Finally, Paul speaks here of good courage. So groaning and a guarantee, and finally good courage. And this is where Paul concludes in verse 6, leading us into how we go about living now. And so he says, so we are always of good courage. We have the Spirit as a guarantee, so we are always of good courage. What does this good courage look like? Well, first of all, it is a confident hope, as Paul describes it here. This is how he began in verse 1, and it's what he carries on in verse 6. It says in verse 1, we know, we know something, we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God. And then verse 6, we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. See, Paul had a knowledge. Paul had a confidence. Paul was certain about the future regardless of the trials of the present. And Paul's saying this is the kind of confidence that we too as Christians should have a confident hope that the resurrection is going to come. It was a confidence, of course, that he had by faith. And he notes that here, doesn't he? He says, we walk by faith, not by sight. So often, of course, walk by sight. There's so many things that are in front of our 
physical eyes that we see day in and day out that sometimes can shake our confidence or shake our faith. Every morning, I see that my hair is getting more gray and also going away. Reminder every single morning that this body is failing. We see it in the news, don't we? Reports of hospitalizations and deaths in and, and these days, of course, due to COVID. See it in, in terms of war. We see our parents aging and needing more care. We understand and realize that maybe our memories are not what they used to be. All of these kinds of things that affect us that are in front of our eyes, evidences of death and dying. But Paul says that's not the only thing that we ought to see. As Christians, this isn't the only thing that ought to be in front of our eyes. While we see those things happening in our lives or the lives of people that we love, our sight also has to be coupled with eyes of faith, eyes that see the promises of God, eyes that see the word of God and understand it and take it to heart, eyes that see the gospel, a crucified but risen Christ was promised that his resurrection is the guarantee of our resurrection. I was able to see in the life of somebody from our previous church, a brother in the Lord, this kind of transformation from seeing with simply physical eyes to seeing eyes with faith. This brother had a severe struggle with the sovereignty of God in terms of sickness and cancer and losses in his life and he would say to me, I don't understand how God is able to be part of any of these things. Kind of had a limited, I think, view of, of God's sovereignty, that God's sovereignty um, reigned over the good things of life, but he couldn't understand how God's sovereignty could be at play at all in the sufferings of life. And then God gave him a new view of himself. In spite of the suffering that he experienced, he found God to be faithful understood that God might not take away his suffering, but he had God in the suffering, and having God was enough, and he could leave the mysteries with God and rest in God's saving work. One of the, the biggest, I think, faith transformations that I've seen in my ministry. Paul lived with that kind of faith and that kind of confident hope. We know that if this tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, God has a building made in the heavens for us. This kind of confident hope, in fact, changed Paul's preferences. He said, we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. It's the same kind of longing that Paul described in the book of Philippians. As he, remember, he said to the Philippian church, I long to be with you, but I also long to Christ. I am torn between the two. I'm not sure what I ought to decide. This would be better for you. It would be better for you if I remain, better for me if I would go to be with the Lord. Paul says, I would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. I long to be with Christ. It changed his preferences, his confident hope, and it also changed his commitment. And you see, this is the other part of the good courage that Paul speaks here. How are we to go about living while we wait for the resurrection? So we can have this confident hope that the resurrection is going to come, but we need to live life now. And how do we go about living in light of the resurrection day by day? Are we to check out, kick back, relax, wait, just wait for Jesus to come? And Paul says, no, absolutely not. Paul says this, whether we are at home or away, whether we're in this life or we are with Christ, we make it our aim to please the Lord. Paul says, this is our aim. This is our ambition. This is what we're aiming at. This is what we're driving towards. This is what we keep our eyes fixed on. How do we go about living for Christ? This was Paul's drive, his ambition, and it must be ours. People of God, how can it not be that? It's inconsistent, isn't it, to long to be with Christ in a resurrected body, 
but to have little desire to curve Christ in this body. If we long to be with Christ bodily in the age to come, it ought to be our ambition to serve Christ bodily with our whole being now. Where does this ambition come from? How does it grow in our hearts so that more and more we desire to please the Lord? Well, of course, it comes from the gospel. The gospel that tells us we have a Savior who loved us and gave himself for us. A Savior who died to pay for our sins, but a Savior who was also raised for our justification. And his resurrection is the first fruits of our own. We will be raised because Christ was raised. That is God's promise. So this ambition comes from the gospel, and it also comes from the reality that we have a Savior who is coming again, also part of the gospel message. Paul concludes like this, verse 10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Who is going to come to judge? And Paul says very clearly here, it is Christ. The judgment seat is Christ's. Who is going to appear before him on that day of judgment? And Paul says, we must all appear before him. So everyone, believer and unbeliever. And what is going to happen there? Paul tells us we will all receive what is due for what we have done in the body, either good or evil. We're going to stand before Christ and we're going to be judged by our works. And the judgment standard is going to be his life lived out in our bodies. Let me say that again that the judgment standard is going to be his life, Christ's life lived out in our bodies. What does this mean? Well, it means, of course, that if we are not clothed in the righteousness of Christ, if we have loved the darkness rather than the light, then we are going to be cast away from Christ forever. But what if we believed? If we believed, how can we be judged by what is done in the body? Friends, the answer is simply this, that our works will simply be a demonstration of our faith and of the saving grace of God at work in us. The judgment is not there to determine our destiny. If you are in Christ, your destiny, my destiny has already been made certain. If we are in Christ, as Paul says in Romans 8.1, there is no condemnation for us. But the judgment will determine the degree of our reward. Remember Jesus teaching in the parable of the talents, the one who has been faithful will with a little will be given much more. God's judgment will be by grace, will be proportionate to what we have done in this body. Who we were in Christ, what we have done for Christ, will be revealed on that last day. Do you remember how Apostle John puts it in 1 John 3? He says, we are God's children now, but what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. In other words, we're going to be in for some surprises in glory. Maybe one of those surprises is simply going to be this, seeing somebody that we have known or seeing another brother or sister in Christ in glory and and maybe saying to them, "I, I didn't know that this is who you were. I didn't, I didn't know that. I didn't see it. And people of God, the hidden truth of what God has made us to be by his grace will be revealed on that day of judgment when Christ comes. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, of course, opens with that wonderful question and answer, what is the chief end of man? The answer to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Well, 37 questions later, in the Shorter Catechism comes the question about the resurrection 
In fact, that question closes the first section of the catechism in terms of what we are to believe. So question 38, what benefits do believers receive from Christ at the resurrection? Well, at the resurrection, believers being raised up in glory shall be openly acknowledged and acquitted in the day of judgment and made perfectly blessed in the full enjoying of God to all eternity. What is our chief end? To glorify God, to enjoy him forever. What's going to happen at the resurrection? We will fully reach our chief end. We will fully, completely, freely, joyfully, gloriously glorify God and enjoy him on and on and on and on. The resurrection of our bodies, this is our blessed hope. And so we do pray, don't we? Come, Lord Jesus, come. Let's pray together. So, Father in heaven, we do thank you for the hope of the resurrection. What we see and what we know here on this earth is often affliction and sickness and trouble and heartache. And yet you have promised that these tents that we live in, they are going to come down and you're going to give instead to us a heavenly dwelling, a building that is not made with hands, but a building that comes from God. And so we do pray, Lord, as believers that we would long for the resurrection to come. In the meantime, Father, we pray that we would make it our aim to please the Lord and our chief desire would be to glorify God, to enjoy him forever. Thank you for your spirit, who is a guarantee. Thank you, Lord, that you are already at work in our lives, preparing us for the resurrection to come. And so we pray that we would be faithful. We pray that we would be earnest to serve you, to love you, to glorify you. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.